I, what the plan is, is I, I was planning on just doing one session on aliens and UFOs, and what had happened, and the more I started doing research, the more I realized, wow, there's a lot here, so we're actually going to be doing this week and next week, so hope you can come back next week, and I'll just kind of lay out the plan. This week, I'm laying out more of just the facts and the history and just kind of setting the stage of where the government claims we're at with this. Next week, I'm going to be showing you some footage of people who've had alien encounters, uh, two people who can actually summon orbs, and they'll, they'll show you how they go about doing that. And then we're going to look at the biblical uh, worldview and see how does the Bible um, give us some understanding how to approach this issue. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys are excited about this because I know I certainly am. And one thing I know in any group, especially when it comes to the topic of aliens and UFOs, we have people from different backgrounds and information of what you know about it. So hopefully whatever I share in the next two weeks will be able to be relevant to everybody wherever you may be at in your knowledge of um, aliens and UFOs. With that, just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's truly a a privilege and an honor to be able to come into your house. And the thing about it is, God, no matter what we see in the world, even things that are unexplained, we can always go to Scripture to find truth to lead and direct us. And that's what our desire is over the next two weeks, is to be able to see, God, how we can understand what's going on around us through the lens of Scripture. So open our eyes, Lord, and open our ears, and help us just to be receptive to what your Spirit has to say this week and next week, and we seek to glorify and honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you guys have been here for a while, what we've been doing for the last uh, several weeks, both on a Sunday morning and Wednesday, we've been talking about deception. And of course, I went through about six weeks talking about deception, and I moved it into the last day's deception. And then from there, we're currently going through a study of the book of Jude and how we're called to contend for the faith. And then if you were here the last two Wednesdays, who was here the last two Wednesdays? So my dad talked about the occult, and I, and I teased Aaron because last week, Aaron gave a great introduction for my father. And I asked him if he was going to introduce me, and he says, no, everyone already knows who you are. So <laughs> I don't get the introduction like he gave to my father. But we've been talking about this idea of the occult and stuff like that. And what I want to do is, and you'll see it much more clearly next week, I want to connect what we see with aliens and UFOs to this whole idea of the occult and then how we can look at it biblically. So let's talk about aliens and UFOs. I mean, seriously, how many of you guys have ever heard this topic ever preached at a church before? <laughs> Man. <laughs> You guys are going to really think I'm crazy now, right? But, you know, that, that's kind of the thing. Why, why is this even an important issue for you and I to talk about at a church? Like, what is going to come out of this conversation over the next two weeks that will have any bearing on our faith? Because at the end of the day, when we come to church, we should be growing in our faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We should be getting in the Word of God. So how in the world can aliens and UFOs have any value at all to a, a setting in a church or to our walk with Christ? Well, that's why I want to kind of lay out with for you guys is give you a few reasons why I believe that what we're going to be talking about this week and next week is vital to your spiritual walk with the Lord. And so let me just kind of lay out, first of all, I think it is so important for all of us to pursue truth. If you've been here the last few weeks, we have talked about one of the main aims of the enemy, and we'll talk more about Satan next week, is deception. Any way that he can deceive us, and we're going to see that God is going to send an illusion on Pompey ten times, that they're, not, they're, that they're going to be led away to, to, uh, into falsehood. So we have to make sure that we as Christians are pursuing truth and we're evaluating what's going on in the world in light of the truth of God's word. And so we're asking many questions. Are we alone? That's one of the major questions right now. And so that's what we want to do. How do we, how do we address this issue of whether there's aliens or UFOs, whatever term you want to use, how do we address it as we as Christians are pursuing truth? And I want to lay this out very clear. We this evening are not looking to promote conspiracy theories I'm not looking to try and do sensationalism. I hope that your heart is like mine, that you desire to know truth. And we understand that as Christians, we're going back to the Word of God as that foundation. So for me, that's how I look at it. No matter what I do in my life, I'm always trying to pursue what is true, and hopefully we can come to a better understanding of this over the next two weeks. That's the first thing. We should all be pursuers of truth. Here's the second. It is a key issue in our world today, isn't it? You can see some of the movies up there. I don't know how many guys, let's see, right now I can start, uh, you know, putting you guys in categories. Who watches Ancient Aliens? I see a few hands out there. So Ancient Aliens, if you've been watching that, they have a very clear narrative about what this is all going on in the world around us. How about Star Wars? Or how about Marvel series? All of these, what are they doing? Their movies are utilizing this as a way to say, look it, there's more than us. There's life outside just planet Earth. And so it's created a lot of conversation about how do we approach these issues because we're being inundated with it throughout the, the media. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you a couple current events to let you understand the stage of why this issue is so central to conversation today. Now, I want to make sure I preface this. Some of the current events that I'm going to show you, I'm not showing you because I believe they're true. 
But I want you to understand that that is creating conversation today about what in the world's going on. Are there aliens? Are there UFOs? So this is the very first one. Some of you guys may remember. This was back in April uh, 30 of this year. A 16-year-old calls police after seeing aliens in his backyard. So I'll give you a little bit of backdrop before I show the video. But uh, on April 30th in Las Vegas, Nevada, which, I mean, right there may already give you uh, kind of a red flag, right? Just, I had family that lived there. It's a unique place. We'll just say that. There was actually uh, two Metro police officers from Las Vegas that they were speaking to a citizen. And while they were speaking, one of the officers looked over to the side, and he saw this light coming through the sky and, and, and going to the ground. Didn't know what it was. Didn't think anything of it. Well, then shortly after, about an hour later, the police get a call from a gentleman who says that he just encountered two aliens in his backyard. And according to him on the police report, he says that he went to his backyard because he saw this light go to the ground. He said that he saw what were, he described eight to, about eight feet to ten feet tall alien-like figures looking at him. He didn't know how to describe them. And so what ended up happening was the police responded to that report, and here's some of the video footage of the police's conversation with this family who supposedly saw some aliens in their backyard. It's almost midnight on May 1st when a Las Vegas Metro police officer's body cam catches this, something flashing low in the sky. 911 emergency. Minutes later. There's, a, there's like an eight-foot person beside it, and another one's inside, and it has big eyes and looking at us, and it's still there. Someone calls 911 reporting two large figures in their backyard. Uh, no, I'm so nervous right now. The 8 News Now investigators obtaining another officer's. And so, you know, once again, I'm not trying to say they saw aliens. I'm just trying to get who, who saw this story before, by the way. So I see a few hands have heard about this. Now, what you may have not known, they were actually the family was uh, interviewed. And in the interview, they, they did two things happened. First of all, they were asked to draw a picture of the alien, but all three of them had to do it separate. And what ended up happening was the pictures pretty much came out exactly alike. And they'd been pretty consistent with their story. And the second thing, according to the family, they said three days after this event, um, a vehicle with government license plates came with three men in black. Now, they went to approach the car, and the car supposedly left. So once again, I'm not trying to assume what happened there, but I'm just trying to share you this is a conversation going on. And, and I want to I lay out here, too. What I'm going to be sharing with you today, I'm not talking about two guys are going off hunting and they're drunk and all of a sudden one of them looks up in the sky and says, wow, what's that? We're not talking about that. We're talking about credible eyewitnesses, police officers. They actually went to that house and if you watch the full video, they're scared to go in the backyard because the one police officer says, my buddy saw some light fall from the sky and we have no clue what's going on. So I want to, I want to lay that out that, you know, I think we, one of the reasons why I never did a talk on aliens, besides the fact no one asked me to come and do it, was, yeah, because I think that there was this idea, first of all, that people talked about this, they were crazy. They have, you know, they're, they're insane, they're hallucinating. And the second thing was, it was so much speculation. But we're getting so much information now that we're starting to be able to weed through what's speculation versus what, you know, could potentially be the case. So, moving along, this was just recent. Um, a guy by the name, hopefully I'm saying his name right, Hamie Mawson, he led an investigation into alien phenomena for decades. And what he did was he claims that he found this body of an actual alien or a non-human life form. And, and this is the thing about it. He presented it to the Mexican Congress just a few, uh, I think it was several weeks ago. It was actually in September of 2023. And so according to the article, it says, alien bodies with three-fingered hands, unknown DNA, and eggs inside are presented by UFO expert at Mexican Congress with the non-humans found in Peru said to be about 1,000 years old. So he says he found this body in Peru, and it was supposedly preserved. Um, according to him, it was wrapped in algae, and that's what preserved it for so many years. And right now, this has gone before the Congress in Mexico. And as a country, they are now debating whether they'll be the first country in the world to actually say there's other life forms than humans. That's how big this thing is. Now, I'm going to show you a quick video, but then I'm going to give you a little bit of backdrop about this guy before we draw conclusions here. So here's a quick video footage of this supposed uh, alien form that he found. So I want to say this, they've done some testing on it. Some scientists seem to allude that there's something here that is non-life. 
Other scientists are very skeptical, say that we need to do more research. The one red flag I'll say about this gentleman, um, I think his name's Hamie Moss, and hopefully I'm saying it right. This is, he has had two other, or at least three other, should I say, supposed evidence of other alien life forms, and all three of them came back to not be true. One of them was actually, uh, I think from what I read, was a corpse of a human child that he said it was a, you know, an alien. Another one he claimed that he found at what he called was a fairy. It ended up being like the actual little fairy, like you see, you know, like in, uh, I'm trying to think of some of those Disney movies, but it was actually a bat. So there's not much credibility on his part, but here's what I'm going to tell you. The reality of us talking about this shows how powerful it is because why in the world would the Congress of a country, Mexico, sit there and entertain this conversation? Because we're all trying to find answers. We're all trying to figure out what's going on. It's another current event. The Pentagon launches a website for declassified UFO information, including videos and photos. So the Defense Department announced Thursday, this is of September of this year, that its office tasked with overseeing efforts to address UAPs that's the term now. We always call them UFOs, but now they call them UAPs. They call them unidentified anomalous phenomena, or I like better, uh, the unidentified aerial phenomena. They said that uh, they launched a new website to provide the public with declassified information above the, about the mysterious objects. So right now, our government has given us a website that you can go to and get on to see about all this information about these declassified videos that they have about things that they can't explain to us. It goes on to say these UAPs are considered objects detected in the air, or excuse me, detected in the air, sea, and space that can't be identified. As of the end of August 2022, there have been more than 500 UAP sightings over the last 17 years, according to a report from this intelligence community. Uh, many of the object sightings were reported by U.S. Navy and Air Force aviators and operators. So once again, we're not talking about some guys off in the, in the woods just hanging out, you know, shooting the breeze. We're talking about government officials that are saying there's something going on, we're not quite sure what's going on, and we're trying to get information. And, and, and what's the motivation for that? I, I think that's the hard thing to answer because I can't question their motives or their heart, but what they're telling us is that they are concerned this is a threat to our military. That's one of the motivations for it, and they're also concerned is that could this be technology from other countries like China or Russia that we're not aware of, and we'll talk more about that later. So moving on, here's another one, uh, another uh, article. Nearly 2,000 reports of UFO sightings surface ranging from orbs, disks, and fireballs. So according to this article, they almost, there are about 2,000 people who have spotted um, UFOs or UAPs in Maryland skies, according to the report shared by the National UFO Reporting Center. The UAPs resembled many different shapes, ranging from circles, ovals, triangles, and diamonds. Other reports describe the shape of the UAP as a light orb, flash, disk, and fireball. And you can see the picture that's on the screen up there. That is a, a picture that was taken by someone who supposedly saw one of these unidentified flying objects in Maryland. And according to the person that took it, this is what they said. We saw this weird flying saucer looking thing, took some photos. It seemed to disappear after I filmed and photographed it for 30 seconds. And so we're going to talk about how these things defy the laws of physics um, later in our, in, our, in, our, in our talk today. But I just want to get you like... We're not, like, when you start to see some of these, like, this is from the USA Today. I'm not taking you guys into some fringe, you know, far, you know, conspiracy kind of source to say, hey, guess what I heard? These are from credible sources that are saying we don't know what's going on. So I know that I keep repeating that, but I want to emphasize that because when I start to talk next week about what does the Bible say and, and what about this, you can at least understand that I'm trying to couch us with incredible information not on some conspiracy or some secondhand sources, okay? So the 10 states with the most UAP sightings, according to the UF Reporting Center, you can see California is the first, and uh, my, my, my sister lived over there with her family for a while, and I can simply say they're crazy over there, so <laughs> sorry if you're from California, all right? I actually went to seminary there, so it's a good state. But if you notice up there, number five, six is Pennsylvania, and number eight is Ohio as being the top 10 states. So the article said, if you're looking to go on vacation, you want to go see some UFOs, here's the top 10 states to go. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine who probably has done much more research on UFOs than I have to say, is there a common denominator or why certain places are much more, um, I guess, accessible to seeing UFO sightings? And really, we couldn't find any connection. I'll simply say, based upon what I read, was that they seem to be in remote areas, okay? And secondly, they seem to be at places that have a spiritual or occult significance. Places like Stonehenge. There's some, some connection here, and we're going to talk about next week about the occult and how it has a very prominent role. 
I mean, just to kind of tease you a little bit, I'm going to show you video footage by a guy who believes that if you do transcendental meditation, you can summon an orb to come to you. And so they're using occult practices to be able to conjure up these UFOs and communicate with them, okay? How about this one, Goldie Hawn? You guys all remember her, right? This was just out this week. And if Goldie Hawn says it's got to be true, right? So she was, uh, she's 77 or eight now, but she said that this incident happened when she was in her 20s. She was living in California, of all places. And, and, and this is what she said about this encounter. She said, I went outside my door. I sat on the little ledge. I looked up at the dark sky, and I saw all these stars. And all I could think of was, are we the only planet in the whole wide universe that has life on it? She said she called out to any aliens listening, saying, she knows we're not alone. I would like to meet you one day. I want to stop right there. One of the things that we find that has a common denominator, people who have contact with alien life forms, is a desire for them to want to do that. They're, they're, they're surrendering themselves um, kind of in a, I guess, in a subjective way to allow this phenomenon to happen. Now, you could argue that maybe that's some type of psychosomatic type of, a, of encounter, but we see this common denominator that they have surrendered themselves or being open to this phenomena, okay? Then she goes on to say about four months later, um, she was sitting down or settling down for a nap in her friend's car while working as a dancer and heard a high frequency in her ear. She claims that, that she then saw three triangular-shaped heads, silver in color, with a tiny little nose, no ears, and a slash for a mouth. The aliens were pointing at me, discussing me like I was a subject. She says she was unable to move, but that the aliens touched me, and it felt like the finger of God. Now, once again, I know that we're not going to sit there and create our theology off of Goldie Hawn, but listen, this happened how many years ago? But now she feels comfortable to share this because now, she's no, if she would have shared this 20 years ago, people would have said, that she's nuts. She's crazy, but now all of a sudden people are saying, wow. And now people are coming out saying, I had a similar experience, and let's talk about what went on in my life compared to what yours went on. So I just want to stop right here. The first two reasons why this is important, we are pursuers of truth, and we should all be as Christians. But secondly, this is a key event that's going on in our world today. And I, I, I can't tell you, unless you have your head, you know, you live under a rock, everywhere you turn, people are having conversations about this. And it's so important for us as Christians to be mindful of this. The third thing that really struck me the most is that this whole idea of, of UFOs and aliens is reshaping how people view the world. You've heard me talk before that, that one thing that holds us together as humans is that we're all seeking answers to certain questions. And the answers that we formulate to these questions, they shape what we call our worldview. And all worldview is in simplistic terms is like a pair of glasses that you wear and that you see the world through those glasses, which is your worldview. Now, I'm assuming that everyone here is a believer, right? And if you are... What is the glass that you should look at the world through? The lens of Scripture. Somehow the church has lost sight of the fact that we're supposed to be what? Have a biblical worldview. So what is going on is that this idea of aliens and UFOs is reshaping how people see the world and how they answer these questions. Who am I? Like my identity. Where did I come from? Why am I here? The purpose of life. How should I live? You know, the ethics of, of what guides our lives. And secondly, or lastly, where am I going? Destiny. So what we're finding out is that as this information comes out more about aliens and UFOs or the possibility of it, should I say, it is reshaping how people view the world. And to support that, let me just share with you this slide. This was a question I was asked, do you believe that UFOs or UAPs are probably alien ships or alien life forms or that they have some natural scientific explanation? And so according to this, back in 1996, about 30, what is it, 20% thought it was aliens or UFOs. And now we're up to 34% that believe that UFOs are alien life forms. So we're seeing a major shift in how people are evaluating what's going on out there. In fact, I saw another study that I'll just read here quickly. It says about 3 in 10, about 3 in 10, about 28% of people report that at some point they have been woken up during sleeping with a sense, uh, with a a sense of a strange presence in their room. And about 25% of people have seen or believe themselves to have been the presence of a ghost or an alien life form. Now, I want to stop right here. I don't know if anyone in this room can say that they've ever had that encounter before, but what we're finding very clearly with these encounters, there is always an occult connection. And what we're going to find next week is that there's ways for you and I to be able to tap into the spiritual realm. Because if we're Christians, we're going to find out there's not just a physical realm, there's a spiritual realm. And what God has clearly said to you and I as believers is there's ways that you approach that spiritual realm. Ultimately, we approach it through what? The person of Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit that lives within us. But then there are other ways you can tap into it, which we find that God condemned in the Old Testament 
because he knew these were destructive ways that could conjure up demonic beings. So moving along here, this was a very powerful article that I read about this whole idea of reshaping the way we view the world. Uh, according to Diane Pasolka, hopefully I'm saying her name right, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina, um, and she also authored a book called The American Cosmic, um, what, which is about belief in the UFOs and extraterrestrials. She says in this book that it's becoming a kind of religion, and it isn't nearly as fringe as you might think. So this is coming from a prominent professor to say, look it, this idea of aliens and UFOs is actually creating a new religion, and don't think it's just some crazy people living off in some mountain. And this is what she goes on to say in the book. We're in a kind of planetary crisis at the moment. There's an increase in apocalyptic beliefs about our capacity to survive on the earth. Apocalyptic means like end, end, of, the, end of the world kind of uh, idea. A lot of people see disaster on the horizon. And there's a deep fear that we won't be able to save ourselves. I want to stop. That is a powerful statement. Because I believe right now that the world is desperately searching for some answer to save the world. I mean, think about it. You know, according to what we see in the world, we have wars, we have famines, we have environmental problems, all these problems. And so what is the world looking for? They're looking for someone to come and solve the problem. And so she goes on, she says this, so what will save us? Well, for some, it'll be these advanced beings who come to, tell, to us and tell us what we can do or how we can escape. Maybe they will help us find another planet to home, or maybe they'll bring some life-saving technology, who knows, but these sorts of beliefs are lurking beneath the law of the popular fascination with alien life. And next week, I'm going to show you some footage of the message that these aliens are communicating to people. And I'm going to tell you something. You want to talk about, like, wow, these guys must really have been reading the book of Revelation because they are doing exactly what God warned would happen in the last days, with deception, drawing people away from a biblical worldview. And what was interesting, she had talked about this too because she said more than half of American adults... About 60%, well, excuse me, just read this. About 60%, excuse me, of young American adults, that's what I meant to say, believe in extraterrestrial life. So what we're seeing is that, you know, I see some of the older people and you're just like, okay, you know, I've lived my life, you know, this is just another one of those things. The younger generation is being shaped by this. So maybe I could have put another reason out here. If you're a grandparent or a parent, these are things that are going to start impacting your children and grandchildren growing up. And so we can't sit there and be like ostriches which are head in the ground. We have got to respond biblically to point them to the truth of who Christ is and why we believe in the Bible. And so that's why, you know, sometimes I know you guys have been to this church. You're like, man, Pastor BJ, you're talking about aliens and UFOs. You talked about transgender. You did abortion. I don't do these because I enjoy doing these conversations. I do that because we have got to be equipped to be able to engage with the issues of this world from a biblical perspective. And that goes to my final thing, and to me, probably the most important reason why we're going to be doing this topic for the next two weeks, we have got to share with others the hope found in Jesus Christ. That's the end game. What hope do you and I have that we can share with other people? Because I want you to know very clear, people are seeking, they're trying to seek some answers to the world around them. They're trying to find some hope. They're trying to find some peace. And we as Christians have the answer that can point them to where they can find hope and peace. In fact, I'll share next week about Michael Heiser. He was a great biblical scholar, passed away a few months ago. But one of the things that he was known for, he said one of his hobbies was he would get UFO, um, you know, kind of uh, conferences. And so he'd get teased by his colleagues. But what he said was what people didn't realize, that at the UFO conferences, it became one of the greatest places for him to have conversations about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because people that were there, they were searching for answers. They want to know, who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Where am I going? And they're, and they're, they're looking at the world like... Many people today say, I can't find the answers in this world. So they're like, maybe there's something way out there on another planet that can give me the answers. And so he said that it's provided a great opportunity to share his faith. And that's what we as Christians have to use, utilize. It's like I said a few weeks ago, with what's going on in Israel, man, can we not speak biblical truth into that? To point people to the fact that God told us what's going on? Like, this isn't a mystery to you and I. We know what's happening over there. And you guys know this is the, this is the heartbeat of my life of this, of this church, but it's 1 Peter 3.15. It says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So that's what I want to do the rest of this evening and next week. I want to try to approach this from a biblical perspective. And what I want to do is try to avoid not getting into conspiracy theories and sensationalism. If you want to talk about that with me after, you're welcome to do that. Because, you know, I've delved into the 
areas. But what I want to do is I want to focus more upon what, not what is possible, but what's plausible. You see, anything's possible. Right now, it could be possible that we're just in a dream right now. You're really not here, neither am I. Anything is possible, but what we're going to get beyond is not what's possible, but what's plausible. What has evidence to confirm that something is actually the case? And so for us, we're going to try to do the best that we can by looking at this issue from the lens of God's Word, which next week will be a major focal point of what we're going to do. So one thing I've learned in my time studying UFOs is that there's three different approaches to this. So today I'm going to figure out where you're from, okay? So if you're going to be honest, you can raise your hand. So first of all, there's what I call the denier, the doubter, and the skeptic. It's like doubting Thomas. I'm not going to believe unless I see with my eyes and touch with my hands. So I haven't seen a UFO, haven't seen an alien. That's where I am. So who's my doubters or skeptics out there? Okay, I got a few. All right, I'm not trying to say I'm changing your view, all right? The second one, and for this one, I've got to get prepared for this, is what I call the crazies. So, <laughs> yeah, there we go. So actually, my son was bored last day and made this for me, so I'm not going to wear the whole time. But there are, there are what I call the crazies, or maybe I'll, I'll use it in a more positive term. There, there's the enthusiasts who love studying UFOs. So who, who's the enthusiast out there? Okay, I see a few hands. All right. I'm trying to see where Phil DiMatteis is. He's here, isn't he? There he is. Phil was one of the guys who got me into the UFO conversation. We've been talking about doing this for how many years? It's been a while. So I'm grateful we're doing it. And then there's what I call... Uh, Okay, and this is, the, this is where the crazies are at. The, the, I don't always have answers to life's greatest mysteries. Wait, I do. It's aliens. So, you know, there you go. And then there's the third category, which really I would say where I'm at, it's, it's kind of the curious. I'm like the curious George. I, I kind of want to go out and investigate and kind of try to figure things out. And, and that's where I want to try to navigate you guys on as a biblical balanced approach to this. It's not that I'm saying it's, that you shouldn't be a skeptic or that it's wrong to be enthusiast or crazy. But, but what I want to do, especially knowing in this room, there could be people on all different levels of what you know about UFOs. I want to try to, to satisfy your curiosity in a biblical way about what's going on. So that's what our job is to do. So what I'm going to do for the rest of, the, of today is I'm going to lay out the history of aliens and UFOs. And we're going to look at why there's a mystery about this, why we can't figure it out. And it will set us up for next week because what I said before... I want to lay down a solid foundation, a credible foundation, that there's some phenomena going on, even though we don't know, clearly know what it is, this is just some, you know, that's something that's happened in the back, you know, alleys with no credible um, information. So this is a very short history of aliens and UFOs. I'm just going to highlight, you know, how this issue has developed within America. If I was doing a global thing, I could talk about things that happened in England and France, but I just want to focus on just our country here in America. So I just found out, um, just the last week, that there was actually a report of a UFO crash in 1897. I was always of the impression that this didn't happen until the 1940s after World War II, but actually in 1897 there was a crash. And so there, according to uh, people that lived in, this, uh, lived in Texas, they, they spotted several sightings of a great airship, and then what they said is that one of the crafts was actually reported to have crashed in Aurora on April 17, 1897. And so according to this report, on this date, April 17, 1897, according to locals, a UFO crashed in a farm near Aurora, Texas. The incident is claimed to have resulted in a fatality of the pilot. The pilot was said to be an alien and buried at the Aurora Cemetery. A stone was placed as a marker for the grave, but has since been removed. And so on the stone, according to locals, the name on the stone is Ned, because that's how they refer to this pilot that was supposedly another life form. But it's, you know, once again... I'm not here to say this was a UFO, that was an alien life form. I'm just simply trying to give you a history of how this conversation got to where we're at today. Then you also have the term flying saucers. You've heard of this term before. We all have heard it, right? So this goes back to the 1947. Um, was really one of the first well-known UFO sightings uh, by a businessman, um, Kenneth Arnold, who claimed to see a group of nine high-speed objects near Mount Rainier in Washington while he was flying his small plane. And so when he was reporting what he saw, he said that he estimated that these crescent-shaped objects were going several thousand miles per hour, and, quote, they looked like saucers skipping on water. And so when the report went to the newspaper, the newspaper came back and said that he claimed that he saw flying saucers. So he didn't claim that, but they took what he said, and that's where the term flying saucers has come from, and that's why we still call them flying saucers. Then we all know about Roswell incident um, in 1947, a rancher, W.W. Mack, um, Brazil came across a mysterious 200-yard-long wreckage 
near an army field in Roswell, New Mexico. Now look, at, I, I could probably do several hours on Roswell. And anyone here, everyone know about Roswell? Most of you do. So just to give a kind of a, a summarization very quickly, there's two camps here. There's the U.S. government that the initial report was that what happened was it was a down balloon. But according to some locals and some people in the, in the military, they said this was not a down balloon. What it was was actually an alien spaceship, and they claimed that the government covered it up, and there was actually, a, they recovered an alien body. And then what has happened is the government came back and they retracted it and had a big conference to explain that it wasn't, and what it was was they were using uh, test dummies in some type of a military, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. But the reality is, is that, that according to the information from the military, they did not use test dummies until the 1950s, after this event. Now the question is, well, who's right and who's wrong? Good luck figuring that out. You know, I guess when you get to heaven, you can ask God, because the reality is we don't know. But that's the idea. There's this kind of concept going on that what we're starting to find out is that these people in the military are saying, there's things that we're encountering, and we don't know what they are, and so the government back in the 1940s, rather than trying to, you know, I guess be very transparent about it, they just tried to create other scenarios about what was happening, where now they're much more transparent. They're saying, we don't know what it is. And so much different change from back then. Then we have Project Blue Book. And, and I want you to understand, one of the reasons why Project Blue Book was started is because after World War II, we started to have a huge influx of UFOs. My personal opinion, I don't want to go too far down this path, is that a lot of what was going on was happening by military uh, sites that was probably advanced technology. Because in case you guys don't know, there, there's moments in U.S. history that aren't the greatest. And what happened is that after World War II, we actually went over into Germany and took some of the Nazi scientists out of Germany and brought them back to America and did our best to try to cover it up. Okay? Because what we were finding out was that they were getting technology that we had no clue how to do it here in America. And fortunately, the war ended the way it did because the technology they were, could have easily allowed them to win the war. Now, the question is, where did this technology come from? That's the debate. Some people say that they were very highly sophisticated uh, scientists who knew exactly what they were doing, and they had knowledge of certain things that maybe our scientists in America didn't do it. Others claim that if you know anything about the Nazis, they were very, very steeped in the occult. In fact, they would do seances, they would do all these other occult things, and they claim that these, that these uh, Nazis who were doing these uh, occult practices were communicating with spiritual beings who were giving them information about how to do this. I'll leave it up to you to decide which one is right or which one's wrong, but my feeling is a lot of things are happening in the 1940s. It's probably just advanced military aircraft that people didn't know about. Not to say that I'm trying to disprove Roswell, okay? But what happened is when Project Blue Book was started with all these UFOs going on, there was a fear by the United States that perhaps a country like Russia had advanced, advanced technology that we didn't know about. So they wanted to try to figure out about all these reports of UFOs. So according to this report, which is done by the U.S. government, they did it from 1952 to 1969, and they compiled a report of more than 12,000 sightings of events. And what they did in this report is that they classified them according to identified or unidentified. And in the unidentified category, they found about 6% of, of these uh, phenomena they could not explain had no clue what they were. And so that kind of, st and what they said in the report, they said they, that these uh, unidentified reports included lights, objects, and unexplained radar readings reported by military and civilian pilots, weather observers, astronomers, and other sources. And so what we're seeing already in the 1940s is the credibility of the people who are seeing this phenomena. And once again, not people on the, uh, on the woods having a party and then, you know, just, you know, somehow seeing something, or they're on drugs out there. These are credible people who says, we don't know what's going on. So really, I would say the UFO movement began in America back in the 1940s. That something was happening, and our government started to realize that, but the government's approach to this was to keep it secret. Don't keep these classified documents. Don't share this with the people. But we're going to see here, in the, in, as we go move on, that they completely changed their direction of how they're approaching this issue now. And so one of the people that was part of Project Blue Book um, was an astronomer who was actually at the Ohio State University. His name was J. Allen Hynek. He came into the latter part of Project Blue Book, and he was actually a skeptic. He believed that most of this could be explained by natural phenomenon, but as he began to do more research, he came to recognize there is something going on that I cannot explain. 
And so J. Allen Hynek was the very first one who came up with what we call the classification of UFO encounters. You guys have probably heard of those. You have the first kind, which is you spot something in the sky and leaves no evidence. Does anyone want to say that they've seen a UFO today? Anyone out there? A few people have raised their hand. Okay. We'll be praying for you guys after service. All right. Now it's decent. <laughs> but that's the first kind. You know, you, you've spotted something. Remember, an unidentified flying object doesn't mean it's alien life forms. And I'll explain to you biblically next week where I believe what's going on. But it's just something you just you can't identify. Um, then you have the second kind which is a UFO leaves some physical trace, like burns in the ground or broken branches. And a lot of people tie this into things like crop circles and stuff, that somehow this is a alien life forms that are doing things that we can't figure out a natural explanation for. Then you have the encounter of the third kind, where you make contact with a UFO, you see some alien pilot aboard one or other life form. And so since then, they've actually added additional classifications. So you have uh, the, uh, the, the encounter of the fourth kind, where you, this is an alien abduction where you're actually taken up on a UFO. And we'll talk about some video next week of people who report that they've had this kind. And then the, the fifth kind, where you have regular conversations with aliens. And we'll talk more about that once again next week. So like I said, I know I keep saying this, but I'm trying to just encourage you to come back next week. Next week, I will show you footage of two people who claim that they can conjure up orbs. And one guy who claims, that both of them claim that they've had contact with alien life forms or one of them claims that they're actually spiritual beings or angels, okay? So that's, and there's some other classifications, but they get a little bit crazy when you get to the second, the sixth and seventh kind, but those five are the predominant ones that we talk about. Then, then what we had was the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. So this is how far we go from the 1940s all the way to the 2007, and what it is, the Pentagon launched the secretive program to investigate UFO sightings. And what was considered, according to this report, science fiction is now, listen, science fact. The agency said in the, in, the, in the papers that they wrote about, and the program was run by a military intelligence official, Luis Elizondo. I'm going to show you a clip where he's interviewed on CNN, and he's asked specifically from the reporter, what did you guys find in your research? Now, before I do that, I want you to know the background of Luis Elizondo. Because once again, we are not talking about people that are not, how should I put it, qualified to say what they're saying. And just so you know his background, he was a senior counterintelligence officer for the Department of Defense. He operated throughout Afghanistan, the Middle East, and Latin America. He's a trained special agent who has countless tactical and strategic missions both during wartime and times of peace. In other words, this is the top of our military. You're going to go to him to get information. And so he was told by the Pentagon to start this organization, and after, when, after he left, he came out and said, let me share with you what I found, okay? Now, I'm not trying to say because he, he's a military guy that he's 100% accurate. I'm just trying to tell you what he said, okay? So let's watch this video real quick, and I'll share some of the reports that came from that program. Um, I think what's important is that we have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. Let's call them aircraft. Things that don't have um, <coughs> any obvious flight surfaces, any obvious forms of propulsion, and maneuvering in ways um, that include extreme maneuverability beyond, uh, I would submit, the healthy G-forces of, uh, of a human or anything biological, uh, hypersonic velocities, low observability, um, positive lift, again, seemingly in, in defying the laws of aerodynamics. So, yeah, um, so, so let me just ask you point blank the question, do you believe that, that life from somewhere else, while you ran this program, came here, visited, observed. I will tell you unequivocally that, that through the observation, scientific methodologies that were applied to, to look at this phenomena, that these aircraft, we'll call them aircraft, are displaying characteristics that are not currently within the U.S. inventory nor in any foreign inventory that, that we are aware of. So I know you're using, uh, you're being clear, but I mean, the answer is yes. Um, my personal, I can't speak on behalf of the government, obviously, I'm, I'm not in the U.S. government anymore. My personal belief is that uh, there is very compelling evidence that we, uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. So that's what we're getting from our government officials. We're getting this idea that there's something going on. Now, I want to make sure I, I say this. We don't know necessarily from a government standpoint what they are, 
and I'll give you the three options next week, okay? But it, we're getting it from credible sources. Here's another example. In 2022, there was an annual report on UAPs by the National Intelligence Assessment. So what they did is they examined 144 reports of what the government once again terms UAPs. And many of the phenomena continue to defy explanation that have been described as exhibiting unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities. And I'll talk about what that means here in a little bit when we talk about how some of these uh, unidentified flying objects are, are literally, they're going against what we know of according to the laws of physics. And then currently right now, we have the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AARO. I, Aaron said, hey, it's almost like my first name, right? So <laughs> I don't know, you just need to put the N up there. But this was established back in July of 2022, and the main job was to improve data, collection, standardize reporting requirements, and mitigate the potential threats to safety and security posed by UAP. So I want to stop right here. Back in the 1940s, if you saw a UFO, basically what you were told by the government, shut your mouth, don't say anything. And so they shut their mouth. For first of all, because they didn't want to get in trouble with the military, but secondly, if I would have said something, what are they going to do? They're going to term you as, you're crazy, you're nuts, you know what you're talking about. Now, all of a sudden, the government has created an organization that says, now we are telling our military pilots, we are telling everyone in government that if you see something, you are to report it. It's almost like the term mandatory reporter, right? You see something, you're called, they're now being told, if you see something, you are now to manually report it. You see the whole narrative has changed. You know, the question is, why has it changed? We'll talk about that next week, all right? But um, once again, this is an office within the United States um, Secretary of Defense that once again investigates unidentified flying objects and other phenomena in the air, sea, and or space or on land. And what's interesting is we'll see a video footage where, or we'll hear someone talk about that these UFOs aren't just in space or in the air. They've actually been known to go in the water and come back out of the water. So just crazy stuff that these things are doing. Um, you guys all know what the big thing was this year, the UFO whistleblowers, right? There was actually three of them who came forward. Now, before I read what, what I, uh, what's on the slide, I want to just let you know that I'm not saying they're not credible sources, but the main problem I had with them is everything they shared was from secondhand information. And so we want to make sure that when we're trying to draw good conclusions, we want to go to primary sources. That means eyewitnesses. That's why I love scripture, because when you read the Gospels, what does it say? We saw this. We walked. We talked with Jesus, okay? So we want to try to get the primary sources, not to deny what they're saying, but uh, there were three of them that were um, part of this. And the main one, which you probably heard of, was David Grush. He was a former military intelligence officer. And what he did is he told a House Oversight Committee that all those stories you've read on the Internet are true. The government has debris collected from crashed alien spacecraft. He also told the assembled lawmakers that federal retrieval teams have collected biological remains from alien bodies. He's also claimed the Pentagon has been working for years to collect and study crashed UAPs. Now, there was a little bit of, uh, I guess, kind of taking steps backwards on some of the things that he reported, but he's still pretty much holding to that narrative that this is information that the government knows, and they're trying to keep it hidden from you. Um, and so along with the other two whistleblowers, this is the five things that came out of this congressional hearing. The first is this. The government is absolutely in possession of UAPs. That's what these whistleblowers are saying, okay? Number two... They're non-human biologic, bio bi I can talk that right, and they were found at a crash site. So in other words, they're non-human. We don't know what that means. They're extraterrestrial or what, but they're non-human. The third thing is this. The officials must establish a safe and transparent reporting process, which once again the government is now doing because they want to encourage people who see this to report that. The fourth thing that came out of it is that there's a stigma associated with sightings that silences possible witnesses. We don't, want to, we don't want to put a stigma anymore. We don't want people to think they're crazy by seeing us. If you see it, we want you to come and report it. And then the last thing is they uh, UFO spotted accelerating to supersonic speeds. In other words, what they're saying is that we are seeing technology that we simply have no idea where it comes from because we don't have that in our own military government. Now, let's just be uh, honest here. Are there things that the military is doing that we're not aware of? 100%. But it's different for me saying I don't understand what they're doing over here to actually seeing phenomena that we have no idea how to explain, especially according to the laws of physics. And that's kind of where we're at right now. It leads us to the last point I want to bring up today. Why is this a mystery? With all these credible sources, what's the mystery about it? Why are we calling these unidentified aerial phenomena or unidentified flying objects? What's the mystery behind all this? So I want to kind of break this down into a couple of key points for you. Because the first thing about this mystery is this. 
We have multiple competent eyewitnesses. And what's the key word up there? Well, two of them. Well, I guess all three of them. They're multiple, more than one. They're competent. That means they're reliable. That means they're, they're, they're authoritative in what they're talking about. And they were eyewitnesses. They were, they're giving you primary evidence of what they saw. And so two of the whistleblowers who prepared before congressional hearing on their experience with the UFOs, guess what they both were? They both were pilots in the military. I'm going to show you a video clip of what they claim they saw. The first one is Ryan Graves. He's an executive director for Americans for Safe Aerospace and a former Navy lieutenant that flew an F-A-18 pilot. The second guy in the interview is Commander David Fravor, who's currently retired. He's a former commanding officer in the U.S. Navy. In, um, in, new, in, excuse me, in November 2004, he was the commanding officer of Strike Fighter Squadron 41, the world-famous Black Aces. So when you hear this guy sharing this, these are not guys that just, you know, read books about airplanes. They fly them for a living, okay? So this is what they say that they've seen. Here we go. We were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. Look down a small, saw white tic-tac object with a longitudinal axis pointing north-south and moving very abruptly over the water like a ping-pong ball. These objects were staying completely stationary in Category 4 hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. You know, I'm not like a UFO fanatic. It's not, it's not me. But I will tell you that what we saw with four sets of eyes over a five-minute period, still, there's nothing. We have nothing close to it. So very interesting. This is a picture that I got from a friend of mine who's in the military, and he was saying that there's this place that they do training, and they see these orbs all the time. And his commanding officer says, look, you're going to see these orbs all the time, and we have no idea how to, how to identify these. It's one of the things that we're finding, especially with military sites, is that we're finding that there's a high activity of UFOs. Now, once again, you could argue some of this could be military. I'm sure that there is. But you see up there, there's a high activity when it comes to um, not only military websites, but nuclear sites. In fact, we're going to hear a guy that claims that he had communication with an alien who told him that they shut off nuclear sites to prevent world war here in, America, uh, here in, the, in, in our world, obviously. And so... This is a one report. These are two Air Force veterans who told that they, had, they testified about their experiences with UFOs interfering with U.S. nuclear missiles. Um, former officer Robert Salis told of his encounter with an orange flying disc that turned off 10 warheads at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana in 1967. Then you have Dr. Rocker, Robert Jacobs, excuse me, um, who um, talked about um, how he caught flying saucers that were over a missile site. And so these are all these reports by these military people saying, we do not know what's going on. And, and the reason why I say that is because if it's, if it's all military aircraft and stuff, you would think these guys are high up in ranking, would have some idea of what's going on. And they don't have a clue. They're in the dark. They don't understand what's going on. In fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a UFO sighting over a nuclear site in Russia. And so we see that very common. And once again, you know what the connection is, I can't really tell you, but it's just something interesting. Besides multiple eyewitnesses that are competent, we have visual evidence. And I know we've all seen those video footages on YouTube where are like, man, what really is that? Is it kind of like doctored? But now we're getting very credible visual evidence of radar, okay, of photos and videos. I'm going to show you a video here. This was a uh, Pentagon released this declassified video in April of this year. It's of a, what they, a UFO that's in the Middle East that is on a that is being recorded by a military, uh, U.S. military drone over one of the bases there in the Middle East. So let's watch this real quick. According to the uh, AARO, which is that this organization set up by the Pentagon, when they were testifying before, um, I think it was before the Senate committee, they said, we simply do not know what that is in that video. We have no clue. All we did was we captured it with one of our drones, and we have no idea why, what it was, why it was there, and, and it had no other explanation beyond that. So we see competent witnesses. We have visual evidence. Here's the last one. They defy the laws of physics. 
So what we find is that do not create sonic booms. And I'm not going to be the authoritative figure here in flying. I see my good friend Jim Irwin back there. So if I say anything wrong, Jim, you can correct me. But one thing we don't find is they do not create sonic booms. And what that is is that when jets break the sound barrier, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, you're going to hear a noise. And what is happening is that these UFOs are traveling in and out of our atmosphere at speeds faster than sound, but they are doing it in complete silence. Okay? Second thing is they make 90-degree turns at speeds more than 18,000 miles. So I, I can't imagine what it would be like for a human to go at that speed making those, those turns. I'm sure it would not do too well to your physical body. They change shape, size, and color at random. And also they materialize and dematerialize without traces. So it's like they appear, they disappear, and this is what they're catching on video footage. I'm going to show you here a video footage of a declassified video that was put up by the Pentagon of Navy pilots. So what I want you to hear these men who are very trained, right? And as they're seeing or counting these UFOs, listen to what they say. I do believe, and I apologize, but I do believe, because if I checked it right, they do blur out all the swearing. But these guys, as these Navy pilots that are trained, they're watching these things. They're like, what in the world's going on here? So watch this video real quick. Dude, this is going on, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. The whole thing, dude. That's not our LNS though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. So, you know, it's almost like they're laughing the video because they're like, we have no clue what this is. And these guys are flying some of the fastest jets in the world. We have the highest technology, and they're looking at these things and saying, what in the world is this? They have no clue. And so what I wanted to establish, I'm going to close here with, with just a quick video and then open up for questions and answers, is just kind of lay out for you the history of how we've got to where we're at, the credibility of what's going on. I didn't draw any conclusions because the two questions we're going to deal with what, next week, what are they? Right? You all want to know, what are they? All right, so we're going to kind of look at some of the potential options next week. And then most importantly, what does the Bible have to say about this? Does the Bible give us any direction of how we can understand what's going on? Because I'll just simply say what we've established tonight is there is credible evidence that there is some phenomena going on that even the highest ranking military people who fly jets have no clue how to explain it. And so what I want to do is I want to close before we go to questions. This is a video here. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Michio Kaku. I hope I say his name correctly. But he is the leading theoretical physicist in the world, very well respected. He's a best-selling author, acclaimed public speaker, renowned futurist, and a popularizer of science. Now, this guy is not a Christian. He does not believe in God. But he's being asked about these UAPs. And I want you to listen to what he says because he's given you an explanation as a physicist. And it's powerful about how he explains it. So watch this quick video. Historically, when physicists were asked about flying saucers and UAPs and extraterrestrial civilizations, the bottom line is you have to have data. You just can't say that, gee, I saw something going across the sky last night. Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. But now we finally have data. The United States Navy has admitted that, yes, there are hours of videotapes, videotapes that can be analyzed to calculate the characteristics of these things. These things require technology beyond anything we have. The ability to fly up at Mach 20, the ability to fly underwater, the ability to zigzag. Now the burden of proof has shifted. The burden of proof is on the military now to prove that these things aren't extraterrestrial. Do you see the power of what he just said? 
he said, before, you know, back in the 40s when we had a little bit of information, the evidence is upon the person who's claiming this. But he said, because we have such reliable information now, where's the burden of proof? It is on the government to prove that this isn't something outside of our own planets, our own solar system. So a major thing. What he does, and I'll just kind of throw this here out real quick, he said the closest technology that we have to what we see with UFOs is what he calls Russian hypersonic drones. They've been used over in Ukraine. But he said there's three problems with saying that these are what we're seeing. Number one, they're very unreliable. They don't have a consistency like we see with these UFOs. Number two, they can't do all the different features like these UFOs can do. Materialize, dematerialize, change direction so quickly. But number three, he said, we have had UFO sightings back to World War II, and this technology was not available back then. So for him, even though that's the closest explanation from a naturalistic standpoint, it still doesn't satisfy the fact that there's things going on out there that we can't explain. So I want to just quickly open it up to any questions, comments, for about five minutes, and then I want to close with just a passage of Scripture. Okay, so anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, yeah thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. I'll just say this. Uh, I hope you come back next week. If you know somebody who's really interested in this or maybe struggling with the occult, come back next week because I'm going to share with you video of people of how they're contacting what they claim to be alien life forms or whatever and the, mo the means by which they're doing it. And you're going to see a huge occult connection with this, and I think it's going to open up a lot of our eyes to what's going on around us. But I want to close with this. I don't want to leave without just giving you a quick scripture uh, reference. You know, Paul, as he is traveling across the Roman Empire to share the gospel, we all know that one of the places that he encountered was the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And, and Ephesus wasn't really different than a lot of the other cities of the Roman Empire. And you can see a picture. Those are some of the ancient ruins. By, by far, they have one of the best ruins of, of any ancient city in the world. Um, but the thing about Ephesus is not only like other cities, they were known for their immorality and their pagan worship, but it was a hotbed for occult practices. And so as Paul goes into Ephesus, God does something very unique with Paul. He empowers him with special power and authority over demonic realm. And there's things that Paul did in Ephesus that are never repeated ever again in Scripture. Although we'll hear, you know, people on television saying, hey, I could do the same thing. I'd be very cautious to try to put my level at the same level as the Apostle Paul spiritually. But this is what it says about what Paul did in Ephesus. It says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and listen, the evil spirits came out of them. The apostle Paul went into the Ephesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, not only to share the truth of the gospel message, but to show that the gospel of Jesus Christ has power even over demonic forces. And so while he's there, these Jewish exorcists, you guys know the sons of Sceva, they're impressed. And so they think, you know what? I'm going to try to do what Paul does. So they see his person is possessed by some evil spirits, and they said, hey, by the Jesus whom Paul exercises, we, we call you out of this person. And so we see in Acts 19, this is verses 15 and 16, what happened to these men. And it says the following, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now, why I show that to you is because the thing that I recognize from the Apostle Paul is that he operated on the proper authority. It was under the authority of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the final point I want to make here. Whose authority is you, are you living your life under? Because I see so many people trying to operate in their own strength, trying to operate almost like the sons of Sceva in some, you know, look at me, look how great I am. But if you're not operating in the power of Jesus Christ, you are in trouble. And the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the Ephesian church. He gives them instructions about how to deal with spiritual warfare. How do you deal with the occult? How do you deal with the demonic presence that's going on around us? And what's interesting, he didn't tell the church, hey, in the name of Jesus, go and cast demons. That's not what he told them. We can argue that point later, okay? But what he said to them, and this is in um, Ephesians chapter 6, he says the following, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, right now, this whole idea of the spiritual realm around us, if you want to have victory, first of all, you have to be under the authority of Jesus Christ. Have you given your life to Christ? And secondly, once you give your life to Christ, you are now what? You are now in a battlefield. There's a spiritual battle going on, but you can't survive just like a soldier can if you don't have the right equipment. 
And here's the beauty. God is saying, I have equipped you with full armor to go out there and to stand in victory against the enemy Satan. Because Satan is, as, the, as it says here, he is what? He is scheming against you and I. That word scheming really means in the Greek that he is cunning and deceptive in how he's attacking us. So the very first thing is besides that authority, we are to put the full armor of God. Then he goes on in verse 12, he says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, I have given you full armor to go out there and what? To be able to engage in the spiritual battle under my authority, under my protection. See, that's why I've said to you before, the battle right now that you're fighting with attention in your home is not with your husband and wife, it's not with your kids. The battle in our country is not a political battle, it's not a moral battle, it is a spiritual battle. And if we're not walking with the full armor of God, we are going to feel and be successful in that battle. And the Apostle Paul says very clearly, this is how you stand up, how you, how you stand against the schemes of the enemy. So here's my homework assignment for you. Read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and look at what that full armor consists of. Because it consists of some great things. The helmet of salvation, the blessed plate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, and the gospel of, uh, of the sandals of peace. And these are the things God has given you and I to be able to stand in victory in this spiritual battle. Not in our authority, but in the authority of Jesus Christ. So with that, let's just close with prayer. Father, I thank you so much just for the time that we have and for the willingness of people to come out and just hear the truth about how we can approach the issues of aliens and UFOs. And God, I hope that over the final two weeks of this study that we would walk away, God, with a greater clarity and understanding of how you have already gained victory for all of us, that we are your children, that we are under your protection and your authority, and that, God, this is not just information for us to go walk out and say, hey, I know more about FUOs, but it's to empower us, God, to not only walk in victory in our own lives with you, but to be able to share the truth of who you are with other people. So, God, just embolden us, empower us, Protect us, Lord, and may we just be a light for you in the places that you called us to. And this we ask in Jesus' name, amen.